Thanks for tuning in to Talking Point. I'm your host, Neeraj Shah. The case for a chat today, well, you can't not talk about metals, especially after the Chinese data that has come out. So, uh, and the fact that the global growth is looking okay. So our rising port volumes, I'm using that as an analogy, uh, a hint of improving or healthy global macros. That's the first point on our radar today. Metals, will they rise higher on stronger Chinese growth numbers? And the Chinese PMI number, is that a lead indicator for that? I think that's the second question that we'll ask our guest. In addition, to talk about how would consumption volumes pivot? Will they move higher staples or will it continue to be confined to premium consumption? Our guest today is Abhay Agarwal, founder of Piper Serica. Abhay, great having you. Thanks for taking the time out. I hope all is well. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Neeraj. As always, a pleasure to be, you know, on the show talking to you. I know the pleasure is entirely ours, Abhay. I assure you that. Let's start off, Abhay, with, uh, with maybe wondering if uh, the world has gotten it wrong in the first quarter about what will happen to growth for the rest of the year. Uh, U.S. data not looking too bad. Europe, I was reading a Garvical research note which spoke about how the Europe data is not looking all that bad in the last couple of releases. China CM, PMI data that came out was also looking better than otherwise. And we know that India is looking okay. So some of the large pockets, are they turning at the margin? And what would that mean for risk assets like equities? I think... We have been tracking China, especially Neeraj, for last six months uh, for a couple of reasons. One is that when, whenever China local consumptions, consumption gets into distress, we have seen uh, that the Chinese large manufacturers uh, try to get into cash by dumping at cost or below cost their products. And that creates a deflationary cycle uh, unintended uh, globally. Uh, and I think Indian companies, a lot of them in chemical space, agrochemical, metals, have suffered because of that over the last six months. Uh, but whatever research we did, we also started seeing over the last quarter, starting January onwards, that there is, that dumping has ceased uh, and stopped being a problem. Uh, and the pricing power was coming back in a lot of categories, especially for drugs, metals, uh, chemicals, agrochemicals. So I think the data coming out now of China of uh, BMI increase uh, and to be followed by better domestic consumption, uh, cleaning up of the, of the real estate exuberance, if I may say that. I think that is all uh, my guess. I would, I would, I'm happy to make a bet that is behind us now. So all the pain that the Chinese economy, Chinese domestic consumption, uh, Chinese exporters had to go through are largely behind them and now we will see Chinese uh, economy recover. The good thing about the Chinese economy is that it's not so dependent on foreign flows, you know, unlike India where for our capex and capital formation is still dependent on international global flows. China is not, it has a lot of domestic capital. So I think China will grow this year and grow at a level that will surprise the analysts probably, driven by domestic consumption. Uh, and this will lead, as you said, your bigger question, you know, will the global growth outlook will be better than estimated? My, my guess, my bet is yes, it would, because I don't see any reasons of, you know, the consumption falling off, interest rates are going to trend down. And when that happens, consumption goes up, the macros continue to improve, especially for India. So uh, I don't want to be sanguine or careless, but I, I would bet that the global growth, global macros will improve from here on. Okay, so two investing implications, and I'm coming to that before I come to the macro again, Abhay. Uh, the first one, let's talk about the Chinese data since you're tracking it so closely. Uh, usually, China growth is associated with uptick, a cyclical uptick in metals. Do you see that happening? Yeah, I think that is a natural outcome, uh, Neeraj, because there is a limited supply of metals that comes into the global markets and the Chinese exporters have been the largest ones there and they have had no pricing power because they have to keep the factories running. And that puts pressure across the board, you know, in a, in a, in a down cycle we saw last year where global consumption of metals didn't fall off the cliff, but at the same time it, it wasn't growing 
in a manner that people were used to. And on the same side, you have supply coming in continuously. Uh, I think that is going to even out. And the natural implication will be that the commodity prices, especially metals, will firm up from here on. Uh, however, I don't think it will be a very sharp uh, uptake. It could happen in some commodities because I'm not, you know, we don't really track the exact monthly demand and supply data. But barring some, I think there will be gradual recovery. So if anybody is, is going to make a bet about sharp recovery in metal prices, I think they would also be wrong. But at the same time, I think the recovery over the next 12 months will be uh, on the higher side. I would expect that generally metals as a commodity basket not will not be surprised to see a double digit growth in pricing from uh, here on over the next 12 months. Mm -hmm. We were talking to Lloyd's Metal earlier, uh, just to try and get a sense of how his business looking like. And of course, he rightly said that the Indian business looks materially different from what China data may or may not show independently. Uh, and was sanguine about volume growth, uh, though mentioned that 13-14% for the last two years was a dream. Dreams don't get repeated, so maybe we see 8-9% volume growth. With that and the pricing numbers and estimates that you may have, Abhay, uh, can we see a constructive rally for Indian metal companies in the current calendar? Or are there better pockets and more predictable pockets to look at? Uh, so I think uh, uh, these are exclusive things, you know. So I think uh, uh, metal space as, a, as by itself, you look at most of the Indian metal manufacturers have not shown any performance over the last two, three years. So I think this year may be a year that, that driven by the volume growth and plus pricing growth, the margins may expand and the balance sheets may get better, improve. The, the only problem I see in this sector, uh, Neeraj, is that because it's a highly consolidated sector now, just like cement. So anytime there is a volume and price pickup, uh, you know, the companies start working on the next capex cycle to, to grow. And, and, and they have this, all of them, rightly so probably, you know, passion for continuously increasing capacity. And that is why this industry goes through its ebbs and flows where supply comes up right at the time when the volumes are tapering off or pricing pressure is there. So that is the nature of this industry. So with that caveat, if somebody wants to play a recovery cycle in this space for next 12 months, you have to, you have to you know, look out for those purple patches when um, you know, exactly I think where we are getting into, which is volume and price uptake to, to play that. But I don't think that these are for long-term investors because these are very cyclical industries at the same time. Got it. About the other, other aspect about, about this growth numbers, right? And if global growth picks up, what it does to inter-country uh, exchange of commodities and uh, goods, etc. I mean, I was reading a, a note from Citigroup on Adani Ports this morning, talking about how yesterday the company spoke about comfortably beating the revised guidance uh, and I'm trying to think if what a port company in India has done is indicative of what the kind of demand is, or is it an isolated case? So my question, therefore, to you is, um, is the strong data release about cargo handled by Adani ports a company-specific thing, or do you think that companies engaged in world trade could actually have a decent run for the next six to nine months, considering that world growth seems to be doing a bit better than what people were factoring in. I think it is, it is, it is a mix of both, Neeraj, because I think Adani is an exceptional manager of Oats business. You know, they really get it, and that can be also seen in the you know, uh, string of pearls acquisition strategy that they have come up with, where they have been acquiring some of these strategic ports and then turning them around, uh, increasing cargo. So I think port management is a very, very complex business. It's, it's a lot of uh, heavy engineering, constant capex, constant improvement in operations, uh, trying to get bigger and bigger ships closer to the port. Uh, so I think it requires a very big player that understands that complexity. And there are very few players in the world who do that, like Dubai Ports and Musk and some of these other guys. So I think Adani is almost at that level. So 
the fact that their numbers are improving, I'm not surprised because I think they're a good operator and in a macro environment where trade into India and outside India is going to only grow, they will benefit more than other, other operators. At the same time, other operators will also grow. But for, from an investment perspective, I don't, again, it's not a buy recommendation or it is not, uh, uh, you know, uh, we may have the stock in our portfolio. Uh, with that disclaimer, I would say that, you know, in an environment like this, one needs to look at the best operator you know, have, who has the balance sheet strength, technical capability, ability to attract talent, get customers, a vision. And I think Adani ports rates right up there, you know, on top of that list. So I think it's a mix of both. Adani being a great, great operator of ports plus the, the macro pickup in the trade business. By the way, standard disclaimer viewers, uh, uh, Adani Group owns Adani ports and Adani Group also owns NDTV and you're watching uh, this conversation on NDTV profits. So just wanted to lay that disclaimer out. But Abhay, this has been fascinating thus far to just get the, the, uh, the, the you know, just the brass tags out of the way. Just uh, anything else on the on the global macro, Abhay, that stands out before we, we need to slip into a break. But before that, anything else on the global macro that stands out for you that you will keep an eye out for that is crude in the picture right now and it's perking up because of the geopolitics. Does that come into the fray or anything else? No, crude, I think people, it's, it's a red herring. It has always been last 30 years that I have been investing. I've heard this, you know, many times. Crude is going to go to 150, 200, 250 and then, you know, just when people are, you know, gearing up their portfolios for very high good prices, it, it corrects. So I think crude has an automatic mechanism like most commodities where the large suppliers uh, understand that, that there is, it is dysfunctional to break the market by charging too high a price. Uh, so I'm not worried about crude prices. It will always spike. That's the nature. I'm not worried about commodity price spike. Uh, geopolitical risk, unpredictable, always there. But what I'm looking at, Neeraj, more to answer your question more closely, is the interest rate uh, uh, correction or you know fall globally. And and once that happens, I think that will start a virtual virtuous cycle of capex, which will further lead to demand and then further lead to consumption and further capex. So I think we can, and people are not budgeting for it, frankly driven by interest rate cuts, we can get into that uh, virtuous capex cycle over the next two, three years, which will see the, uh, the, the risk assets also perform well. Tata Technologies is a stock in focus after executing a joint venture agreement with BMW Holdings Netherlands. What does, what is this about and what would it mean maybe for Tata Tech? My colleague Puneet Johnson to give some perspective here. Puneet, good morning. Hi Neeraj, good morning and as you rightly said this agreement is very very key for, for Tata Technologies. Uh, looking at the key details as per the exchange filings now, uh, this JV expected to deliver uh, automotive software which includes software defined vehicles. Now for the premium vehicles there is a very high content for, for software and Tata Technologies works with a lot of these EV as well as the premium players. Uh, while they say that uh, the automotive software defined vehicles solutions for BMW is what they are going to offer. Uh, the current stake is really 50-50 by both parties in this particular GAV. And they say that the, they will establish automotive hubs in Bangalore, Pune, as well as Chennai uh, in India. Now the focus will be delivering automotive software and as well as uh, SDVs, the software defined vehicles for BMW, while they say that this will lead to transformative solutions for business IT solutions as well. Uh, currently, it's very interesting that lately JB Morgan had written a report on the ERD segment where they saw they had an underperformed rating on Tata Technologies, which uh, had a target price of roughly 800 rupees, which is roughly 20-25% uh, below the current market price. Now, they had said that uh, high client concentration was a key factor, which was a problem for Tata Technologies, and JVs such as this with the likes of BMW will be key to get out of this high concentration. And they had also mentioned that 46% was the current revenue from these anchor clients, such as Winfast previously that they had worked with in 2000. 21 and they say that they needed big evidence uh, such as such deals like JV uh, with BMW to uh, have a positive view on the stock so this JV is going to be definitely a very big big key trigger for Tata Technologies and more details are awaited from the same back to you. Puneet, thanks for putting this into perspective viewers lest you get confused the JP Morgan note is of the past when this announcement had not come in now that it has come in, we may well see JP Morgan change their stance as well because clearly their, their note suggested 
that there is not enough ability to scale up non-anchor clients and the anchor client exposure is 46%. This may help Tata Technologies balance it out and which is why I think we're seeing this 5% uptick on the stock today. Uh, Abhay, now come in on this one, 6.5% actually, but come in on this one. Tata Technologies, uh, ER&D stock, uh, that space has done very behave very differently than the traditional IT services and which is why the valuations given to these stocks. Do you think that announcements such as these or the ones that KPI has done with Renault or, or some of the other companies in, in, in Japan or LTT is doing it not just in the auto space but otherwise as well, does it keep the interest alive in ER&D stocks? I think Neeraj, the ER&D companies are exactly what the IT services companies were in late 90s, early 2000, you know, uh, growing very rapidly, acquiring customers and customers uh, looking at them not only for saving cost or saving prices or, or, or you know, reducing cost arbitrage, but for getting talent, you know, which they could not get in their country, uh, not available as easily. So I think the er and play, investors need to look at it with a five to 10 year perspective and look at it as a space where near term valuations will stay elevated. So it's not a value buy, but it's a classic growth space where the bets you make will make you the similar returns that IT services companies made uh, for 10 to 15 years, starting uh, early 2000s. Uh, I think it's a secular growth path. The whole world is looking at Indian talent uh, in this space. And the companies that can uh, manage that talent, get bigger and bigger contracts, I, I think they'll all win. So uh, we are very bullish on this space, uh, ERND. We are also bullish on the whole EMS space because that is also mimic mimicking in terms of growth uh the, the the same sector you know so uh, uh so i think you know it's, it's something that investors should definitely look at with a longer term perspective got it now uh, which brings me to my next question and which is uh consumption and abe uh, hitherto for the last so many months or quarters if you will premiumization premium consumption the upper end of the k-shaped curve that we've spoken about for so long now has done well, both in numbers and in terms of stock price performance. Uh, could this now change a little uh, in that Staples and FMCG? Can they make a comeback? Or do you reckon that uh, it will not be one at the cost of other and both can do well? I think on the Staples side, we have had a different view. Uh, we don't think that and I personally, whatever data I've looked at, I don't think that the there is any uh, slowdown in growth uh, in staple consumption. What has happened is that there are very competitive uh, domestic players, regional players who have come in and taken uh, market shares in some of these staples categories across food, personal care, uh, and, and, and other such categories. Uh, and the larger companies have been slow in reacting to that competition. And I think it is now that they have started reacting to that competition. So I think the overall market is still growing, is still growing at, in terms of volume at close to seven to eight percent at least across categories. Uh, it's just that the larger companies that are listed are not able to get a large part of that growth. They're getting a smaller part of that growth. So they are they have gone back to the drawing board in terms of optimizing their cost structure, optimizing their product portfolio uh, uh, to cater to this new competition as well as the new demand uh, from customers. So I think we are in that adjustment cycle and I think in another quarter or so, the volumes for the larger players will again start picking up uh, is, is, is the bet that we are making. So we are not in a hurry to add any large staple or uh, FMCG or uh, personal care company to the portfolio right now. We'll probably wait for a quarter or uh, so uh, to see how, how you know, they are redefining their competitive strategies. 
What, what about the others, the, the, the premium stuff? I mean, uh, there is a, I mean, I'm just using names, but a Landmark Cars and Ethos um, and, and a clutch of other names which are niche mm -hmm. consumption. Yeah. They've done very well thus far, Abhay. Yeah. Do you think the momentum can continue? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. I mean, any way, way we look at it, you know, Neeraj, I was in Middle East, roll off last week and travel through multiple airports. And it was remarkable that at all airports, the largest buyers of any product in the duty-free shops and in the city were Indians. And they were just lapping up stuff, you know, it was like flying and this is across, it, and it's not restricted to Clued only it. alcoholic beverage. It's like- You included, everybody. Abhay? <laughs> I, 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 I wish <laughs> I was observing, I was busy observing more. So. <laughs> sorry, sorry, but please finish your point. Yeah. Yeah. No, so I think uh, what is happening there, uh, Neeraj, is that uh, that this premiumization is very evident and uh, companies like Ethos and all have been hard at work for many years, but it's only now that they have come to the forefront and are being recognized for the work that they are doing. And they are all category creators, you know, so and these category creators will continue to grow. Uh, the good thing is that these industries are consolidating very fast, even at an early stage. So, so some of these companies will benefit a lot more uh, than the new entrants as they build their brand uh, and try and explore newer subcategories, like in case of Ethos, uh, used watches uh, 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 or trading in secondhand watches, premium watches. Um, I think this is a big, uh, big space that will continue to grow. This premiumization story is aspirational as the country gets richer. It is going to aspire for better and better quality stuff. Got it. Abhay, last question. I've asked you a lot from my end. I would love to understand from you. Uh, I mean, uh, presuming that, I mean, whatever cash levels you might be or not be sitting at, and however constructive you are, what is your top overweight position and why, Abhay? Uh, so I think some of these positions, uh, we, we are in the process now, uh, Neeraj, of rebalancing, annual rebalancing of our portfolio, uh, where we uh, uh, cut the allocation to some of the stocks that have run up uh, over the last one year and have gone higher than our model portfolio weight. So our number one holding is geo financial services uh, right now. Uh, then we have CDSL uh, uh, and uh, we have Maruti, uh, uh, Reliance, Dr. Reddy's. These are some of the stocks that have done well for us. So their weights have gone up. Uh, what we are looking to do now, Neeraj, is that we are, we are uh, uh, last year our model portfolio indicated uh, the next 12 month return of uh, 40% and we did about 57%. Uh, but now the new model portfolio we have is indicating, uh, forecasting a return of 18.5% for the next 12 months and which is expected because a lot of return has already been made last year. Uh, we are overweighting large caps in our portfolio from 30% to 55%, reducing uh, the small and mid cap to about 40% and keeping 5% cash in the portfolio. So that is the portfolio strategy now because we see more value in large caps uh, that have gone through time correction over the last uh, three, four years, especially in insurance space and some of the other spaces. Uh, pharma will continue to be a large part, and on terms of contrarian pets, it continues to be agrochemicals and some chemical names. So that's the overall portfolio uh, tilt, uh, Neeraj, at this point of time. Great. And viewers, standard disclaimers, of course, uh, none of what Abhay Agarwal has said is a recommendation. It is merely him disclosing what their positions are. You can uh, please do your own due diligence and research before you try and act upon anything uh, on the on the back of his confidence into some of the things that he's spoken about. But Abhay, always a pleasure talking to you. Thank you so much for taking the time out and speaking to us today. Thank you, Neeran. It's my pleasure. Look forward to being on back on the show. Sometime. Thank you. Most certainly. And viewers, thanks for tuning in to this edition of The Talking Point.